Hello, this is Rupinder Syal and welcome to Spartan Tutorials. In our previous video, we talked about production of recombinant proteins in prokaryotes. We also discussed the advantages as well as some disadvantages or limitations of producing recombinant proteins which are usually human proteins or mouse proteins in, in prokaryotes using bacteria such as E. coli or Lactococcus. And one of the problems was there was no splicing of the genes, sometimes there was problems with glycosylation or post-translational modifications of the proteins. So sometimes it is helpful if we can use eukaryotic systems to express recombinant proteins. So let's talk about today about how we can produce recombinant proteins in eukaryotic systems. Now the requirements for producing a recombinant protein are pretty much the same whether you have a prokaryotic system or eukaryotic system. The basic elements still remain the same. So just like we discussed in the case of prokaryotic systems, we have promoter. The only difference here will be it will be a eukaryotic promoter with more elements. So for example, the promoters in eukaryotes, they have Tata boxes, sometimes initiator element, downstream promoter element motif 10 element. These are some of the sequence motifs present in the eukaryotic promoters. So we need to choose an appropriate promoter and there are a lot of options available based on the eukaryotic system that we have. So we can choose a, a very strong or very strongly rep repressible or inducible promoter based on our requirements. We need a ribosome binding site also and in this case it will be COSAC sequence. Remember in the prokaryotic system, we had the shine delgarno sequence. COSAC sequence acts as the ribosome binding site. It was first identified by Marilyn COSAC and that's why it is named after Marilyn COSAC. We have our gene of interest that we want to express and we need our transcriptional terminator. Okay, these can be derived from eukaryotic genes as well. Usually, for example, yeast alcohol dehydrogenase transcriptional terminator is used and some other terminators are available. So this is the basic architecture of the clone that we want to have for our recombinant protein. Now, how do we go about choosing a system where to express it? Well, the first system of choice that we have is the yeast. Okay, that's the Baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So this is the scanning electron micrograph of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It is a very minimal eukaryote and lots of studies have been done on it. Its genome is sequenced. Basically, the iconic studies of cell cycle, for example, were all done in uh, budding yeast and the fission yeast. So a very remarkable, very easy to use system. These have very comparable growing times as compared to E. coli. So you can consider it as the E. coli of eukaryotes. So very easy to use and very easy to manipulate system. So here are some of the promoters that we have for expressing recombinant proteins in yeast. We have the galactose promoter from the galactose metabolism. It is the GAL10 promoter. It can be induced by galactose. Alcohol oxidase promoter. It can be induced by methanol. Glucoamylase promoter, which can be induced by starch and repressed by adding xylose. So it is a inducible as well as a repressible promoter. Very useful if you want to have flexibility of expression. And finally, we have cellobiohydrolase promoter. And this can be turned on by adding some cellulose into the medium. So these are some choices of promoters that we have. The list is growing day by day. So you can keep up with the literature about what are the different systems used by pharmaceutical companies as well as biotechnological labs. What are the promoters used? There are constant updates about this. Now here is the problem or sort of a problem that human proteins when you express them they usually have some sort of glycosylation. Most of the human proteins as well as higher eukaryotic proteins they have some sort of N-terminal or O-terminal glycosylation. Now the problem with Saccharomyces cerevisiae is that it is too enthusiastic, very excited about glycosylation so it turns on the glycosylation a little bit too much. So it leads to a hyper glycosylated protein. So hyper glycosylation means more 
sugar moieties are added than necessary it is a problem because when we are developing it for pharmaceutical purpose and we are for example injecting it or taking it into the human system it can trigger an antigenic reaction so that is a problem so there is some limitation to yeast as well all is not perfect as is true with any biological system the other yeast that we can use is Pichia pastoris and that is also indicated in the previous figure here and you can see that the pattern of glycosylation is very similar to what we see in humans this is just a schematic but we want to illustrate that a glycosylation pattern in human proteins as well as recombinant proteins produced in Pichia pastoris are pretty much almost the same almost equivalent the problem with Pichia pastoris right here it comes the light the limitation of the system is that it sometimes degrades the, pro the protein so the yields may not be that much so that is that is a problem sometimes so we have to balance what do we want we want a hyperglycosylated protein or uh, or a very low yield of properly glycosylated protein so that those are the kind of limitations that we have to work with anyhow we can use other yeast species as well so depending upon uh, you know these limitations people are always coming up with more and more yeast species that they can manipulate and they can use as you know biofactories basically for example hensenula polymorpha Yerovia lipolytica these are all yeast species and cluveromyces lactis these are emerging as prominent biofactories for expressing eukaryotic proteins cluveromyces lactis is especially promising because it can be grown on food waste also so very good for you know for example turning waste into something useful you know it can grow on food waste so very useful and other filamentous fungi for example asperginus nudulans and trichoderma rhizi these are also emerging as good model systems for expressing eukaryotic proteins another important system of interest is the baculovirus system so baculoviruses are viruses which infect insects they are not infecting mammalian cells so we are pretty much not harmed by them so we can grow them pretty easily and they exist in this occlusion body form outside the system outside the host so you can see this nucleopolyhedrovirus this is the occlusion body type form that they have while they are outside the host and inside the host they have two different kind of morphologies one is the occlusion derived virus these are the virions or active particles which are given rise to by the multiplication of the baculovirus inside the host cell and for cell to cell transmission we have another form which is called the budded virus this is the form that you know helps in the transmission from one cell to another so there are multiple forms of this and it is a very important system because the pattern of glycosylation although it is a little bit different from human systems but you know it is a very useful system because insect cells can be grown on a mass mass scale and these can be scaled up very fast and one example of it was the recent vaccine developed by Novavax the Novavax vaccine against COVID-19 was developed in baculoviruses they used the SF9 cells to infect these cells with baculovirus containing the fragment of the spike protein gene of the COVID-19 and SF9 cells actually is derived from SF stands here for Spodop Spodoptera frugiperda. This is the fall army worm. So this is a moth whose cells are basically used and they are used as hosts for these baculoviruses. So a very good example of how biotechnology you know, impacts over real life. So you can see the current impact of this research. And finally, we can also use higher organisms like cattle, livestock for producing proteins very easily. If it really goes through all the hurdles that we have sometimes, for example, regulatory hurdles are there sometimes and sometimes the expression is not right. If all goes well, farming, which stands for producing of pharmaceutically active compounds in comparison to farming that we have, it is a very attractive opportunity we can use 
promoters like beta lactoglobulin promoters which direct the protein expression into the mammary glands and we can obtain our recombinant proteins in the milk of the livestock for example goat or sheep or cows this is a very useful and you know probably one of the best systems that we can have you know the downstream processing is very simple it is very easy to obtain large amounts you know the life cycle of these animals as long as they are alive and the protein is being expressed you can have probably hundreds and thousands of milligrams of this protein you know very very good system the problem is sometimes the public misconceptions about it and the regulatory hurdles about it you know they impede progress regarding this although it is a very superior system so the time you know will tell whether the system gets widespread use in the industry of uh, biotechnology so here is the system in the nutshell we culture somatic cells from the livestock from cows for example we can inactivate immunoglobulin genes which are of the cow and we can introduce human immunoglobulin genes so these will have human immunoglobulin genes in them using nuclear transfer we can you know create transgenic cows or buffaloes in this example and then if we immunize it with any protein of interest that we want to raise our antibodies against it will produce you know uh, recombinant antibodies which are human in nature from in their serum very easy to use you know you can purify them very easily another thing we can do is we can it, it has been done is that we can create transgenic goats you know these are uh, producing recombinant proteins in the milk of the goat so this has been tried and this is tested the only problem is the efficiency of creating the transgenic is very low the overall efficiency of you know proper uh, term of the pregnancy of these transgenics is pretty low so as you can see like less than 10% are transgenic so if we can improve the efficiency of the system this is a pretty remarkable technique so it is still in the nascent stages after all these years of development but still i think it has hope and finally we come to plant farming plant farming refers to the same concept production of pharmaceutical compounds using plants and one of the products has actually been marketed in and it has been approved in 2006 the first product was approved it was anti thrombin 3 this is involved in blood clotting this was approved uh, the trade name was atrin but due to commercial reasons it was withdrawn later on later on in 2012 this product which is shown here ali liso by protalix therapeutics company it was later acquired by pfizer they produced this compound they they produced this enzyme taliglucerase which is basically recombinant human glucose cerebrosidase and it is used for the treatment of a lysosomal storage disease called the gaucher disease so these are you know very useful compounds and can be produced in plants as well and plants are very useful if we want to really test the expression of proteins very quickly and we want to scale up later on in other systems for example as you know agrobacterium mediated transformation is the method of choice for introducing foreign genes into plants and we can transiently express these foreign proteins check their you know activity whether they are expressing well and then we can scale it to scale it up to other systems so here we have our target dna sequence we use electroporation to you know get the plasmid vector inside the leaves then we say use clone selection from agrobacterium okay we amplify agrobacterium you know grow it in mass cultures then we have tobacco plants which are 6 to 8 weeks old and using vacuum infiltration we basically transiently transfect these dna constructs into these plants and after a few days of controlled growth we can extract and purify our recombinant protein so very easy to use method similarly tissue specific promoters have also been uh, tested and their expression in for example seeds or leaves has also been tested for plant uh, protein expression of recombinant proteins so for example from the beans fasciolus vulgaris 
we have the beta phaseolin promoter and similarly we have many tuber specific promoters many plants uh, seed specific promoters these can be used to drive the expression in the leaves or seeds so we can harvest them and use those leaves or seeds or other parts of the plant for uh, purifying our protein so here is one type of setup that we have we have seed based production and leaf based production we can have the sowing and germination of the seeds you know you want to sow, sow and germinate these transgenic plants we cultivate them monitor them for you know proper growth harvest the seeds or harvest the leaves disinfect them you know uh, do proper culturing then we mill the seeds or shred the leaves and then use filtration separation downstream processing steps and then using chromatography and standard protein purification techniques we can purify them so we have a very broad choice of eukaryotic expression systems we have eukaryotes very simple for example yeast we have baculoviruses we have other fungi we have animals for example livestock animals and we have plants and these are you know plenty of opportunities for us to express recombinant proteins in eukaryotes and i uh, think that you know the future is ripe for farming especially if we can use these livestock animals or plants for producing pharmaceutically active compounds that will be really good okay so i hope you like this discussion of recombinant protein expression in eukaryotes please give the video a thumbs up if you liked it till the next time we meet take care and bye bye